Good evening, and a special good evening to those of you downstairs. Student barristers often tell me they want to practice human rights law. When asked what's that, they have some idea that it's a, a right that is regardless of race, nationality, culture, background, but they're pretty unsure of detail. And so are we all. I found a short film by an American action group um, that rather made the same point. Human rights is, um, geez, that's a good question. Human rights. Well, that's a tough one. Wow. Um, I don't even know how to give that a definition. I would probably have to do a little bit of homework or something. Yeah, any right that I think any, just as a normal, you know, uh, human, any... The rights that humans have. Uh, oh, that's a very large debate. We just take them for granted that they're there, but we don't even consider what they are. Should I have been downhearted at my students' easy, if under-informed enthusiasm for the fashionable legal practice of human rights? Probably not. Their answers showed at least two things. One, that they had a feeling that there was something that was attached to the human that was his right, and that second thing is they'd like to work in that practice rather than in one that simply dealt with the passage of money from pocket to pocket. So quite a happy result, I felt. But before we part from the film, here's a second very short extract that shows there can be rather more serious concerns. If people have the right to food and shelter, why are 16,000 children dying of starvation every day? One every five seconds. If people have freedom of speech, why are thousands in prison for speaking their minds? If people have the right to education, why are over a billion adults unable to read? If slavery has truly been abolished, why are 27 million people still enslaved today? More than twice as many as in 1800. The fact is, when it was signed, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights did not have the force of law. It was optional. And despite many more documents, conventions, treaties, and laws, it's still a little more than words on a page. We'll come back to that conclusion perhaps a little later. In this and the next two lectures, I hope with you, those of you who are good enough to come back, to work out something about what human rights may mean for us now, as well as to ask what, whether they really exist as a separate species of right if they do, where do they come from? And significantly for us, has their development in the last few de decades done for the good or for the bad? The discussion can hardly have come at a better time, fortuitous though that is, in light of the fact that there are some politicians and their electors who would seem to like to have no more to do with some forms or formulations of human rights, believing them to be worthy of as much regard as our health and safety regulations and other un-English things coming from a small continent cut off from the mainland of Britain. The rights we consider, the rights of men, women, and cross-genders, humans, that they may have against other humans, individually when they exercise kingly or dictatorial power or when they form governments. They're not rights against nature or against the animal kingdom, and indeed, to reverse that and to state the obvious, animal kingdom, numberless as they are, have no rights against men, uh, who will, of course, kill them at will if they find them tasty, or imprison them inside some stockade if that suits their purpose. Equally obvious is that humans do not, as a matter of fact, have unlimited, unqualified rights, because they too can be killed in lawful war or by capital punishment, and they may be imprisoned lawfully by due process. All rights are qualified and they vary over time. The founding right of today's human rights, the 1948 UN Declaration of Human Rights, is sometimes an uncomfortable read if set beside modern Western views on marriage, homosexuality, rights of women, or indeed against the strong views of the Sharia law. And indeed, 
66 years after that particular instrument was passed by the United Nations by 58 members, uh, the, the then 58 members of the UN, it's pretty unlikely if such a document could now be passed given the increasing diversity and open diversity of the 195 members of the UN and the very strongly expressed religious views that there are within that number. Nevertheless, human rights are with us. They are described as universal and important word because if it is universal, if they are universal, there's nothing that can change them. There's no religion, no philosophy, uh, no political creed that can be above them. That's, of course, something that some states find unappealing. If human rights are universal because they are either part of the human's very being or because they were conferred on us by a god, then they will always have existed even if unidentified and will continue forever to exist in roughly the same form. And it's this concept that both stimulates an interest in human rights and also brings about some objection to them. Early days. There are many possible starting points for human activity that may reflect human rights. Some people go back as much as 2,000 years before Christ to the pharaohs or the Babylonian king Hammurabi. But much commentary these days turns to one 6th century before Christ object as being of critical significance. Now, in 539 BC, the um, armies of Cyrus the Great, there he is, the first king of ancient Persia, conquered the city of Babylon in modern-day Iraq, part of what was a huge empire under this immensely powerful man. A clay cylinder inscribed with the declaration of Cyrus in the Babylonian language was buried beneath a building in Babylon, not to surface until its excavation in 1879. Very recently, the British Museum, along with the Iran Heritage Foundation, has arranged for a tour of that cylinder. There it is. It's about the size of an American uh, baseball, uh, uh, football. Um, a bit smaller, I think. And they arranged for this to go on a, a hugely publicized and very successful tour of Iran and indeed of America. And we can learn the perception of this particular object and its role in human rights from one or two of the things that the curators of Museums Concerned said. So that, for example, when it was on tour with the Getty Museum in America, Timothy Potts, the director, said, even before its discovery, that's the discovery of this particular object, Cyrus, the, the great, had been renowned as a benevolent and noble ruler. The Greek historian Xenophon presented him as an ideal leader in his Cryopedia, which is a book to which I'll turn ab about him in a second, while Old Testament texts praise Cyrus for bringing an end to the Jewish exile in Babylon. Taking control, um, taking control of uh, uh, Babylon, he restored religious traditions and permitted those who had been deported to return to their settlements. And rather than imposing in Persian practices on its people, however, he sought to uphold their tradition, as is indeed evident from using their language on this little object. And it wasn't just what Cyrus the Great said and what he inscribed on the cylinder, but it's what he did two and a half thousand and more years ago that makes him a focus for the origins of human rights. He freed the slaves. He declared that all people had the right to choose their own religion, and he established racial equality. We can actually see, um, in, in, there's a, a, a version of the translation that I think accompanies the document, the uh, thing itself when it's on display in the British Museum. But what's actually written on the cylinder includes the following, and it's quite powerful. I announce that I will respect the traditions, customs, and religions of the nations of my empire. I'll never let any of my governors and subordinates look down on or insult them until I am alive. From now on, till God grants me the kingdom of favor, I will impose my monarchy on no nation. Each is free to accept it. And if any one of them rejects it, 
I never, resolve, I never resolve on war to reign. Until I am the king of Persia, Babylon, and the other nations of the four directions, I will never let anyone oppress any others, and if it occurs, I will take back. Until I am alive, I will prevent un, uh, forced labor. Today I announce that everyone is free to choose a religion. People are free to live in all religions, to take up a job, provided that they never violate another's rights. I will present slavery and my governors and subordinates are obliged to prohibit, and so on and so forth. Wow. Two and a half thousand years ago. This ancient record has been seen by enthusiasts as the world's first known charter of human rights, and it's translated into all six languages of the United Nations, and there's a facsimile of it given by the sister of the Shah in 1977, I think, that sits in headquarters in New York. But Cyrus has his detractors, notably in Germany, where he's said by some to be something of a despot, just like any other land grabber. And indeed, Tom Holland, an English historian and author, wrote the following about the rise of Cyrus in his book, Persian Fire. He said, it's nonsense, absolute nonsense. Um, sorry, we'll come back. It's nonsense, he said, absolute nonsense. The ancient Persians were not some form of early Swedish social democrats, <laughs> adding that conquering a huge empire in the ancient world didn't come without a list of atrocities, and Cyrus staged several salutary atrocities when he invaded. But he, uh, Tom Holland also made this quite interesting point to have in the back of your minds. He said, one of the reasons that the UN is so keen to embrace as an important origin of human rights, this particular thing, is that it has an Eastern flavor to it. And the UN is so heavily under the domination of West, they'd like to sort of share the credit. Well, that's a particularly skeptical view of the sincerity of things that the United Nations does, but never mind. Because these criticisms, even if they are true, may be irrelevant for our present purpose. If the way Cyrus was presented in biblical texts, for he was, and by his decree on the cylinder, there you can see it at the top, and those assertions were in fact believed by people, despite being self-generated untruths of Cyrus, and if they were then applied by others, then the text may have been for the good, however much Cyrus may have been for the bad. However, the buried cylinder to be read only by the gods, couldn't have affected subsequent thinking, but the writings about Cyrus did. And it's worth having this in mind, that even if Cyrus was genuinely for the good, does another issue arise when we think about rights? This so-called first charter of rights could have been just good advice for others to follow in the governance of empires and countries. Or it could have been something that Cyrus chose to give to his people. Not something that they claimed, asserted, or grabbed from him. And that leads to a question for us to consider as we consider what are our rights, our human rights, and indeed others. Can rights be given? Or must they, as a minimum, be asserted, if not actually demanded or seized? Now, Cyrus' is thinking, immortalized by Xenophon, as I've said in the Encyclopedia, the, Cy the Cyropedia, which was a fictionalized account of his life, uh, was read very widely because Xenophon was uh, Socrates' pupil. And so these thoughts found their way to Greece, and we know also from Cicero that they found their way to Rome. Cicero had... Um, studied the Cyropedia and he wrote to one of his relations very favorably about the fictionalized Cyrus who was the subject of the book. And so there, rapidly, but we'll come back to it briefly, our origins of human rights could be, depending on your conception of things, as long ago as 2,500 years. Because of course what Cyrus says is pretty much exactly what you get in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think, chapters one to four. Well, now, the conception that humans had rights somehow permeated 
the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, and Europe saw the, saw the first document famously to deal with such things uh, uh, in the Magna Carta in 1215. Now, that document, Magna Carta, had little initially to do, at least by purpose, with ordinary men and women, only with the rights of barons and their powers. Nevertheless, signed as it was at Runnymede on the 12th of June, uh, 2015, so we're in for a lot of celebration next year, um, the king attached his seal, signed the document as it were, uh, and dealt with the unhappy group of noblemen. This first proclamation that the subjects of a crown or the crown had legal rights and that the monarch, then indistinguishable from the state, could be bound by law, became the first document to set out the right of habeas corpus in different wording and set a tradition of civil rights in Britain that still exists today. The petition of right comes next, that's 1628. It ended a bitter contest between Parliament and King Charles I over the way he was running and funding the Thirty Years' War as it would become known. And this petition called on um, the king or required the king but relied first of all on a statute from Edward I's reign which dealt with the ability of the king to make, uh, to, to make funding, to get taxes without the common consent of parliament. It also, uh, the document of 1628 looked back to Magna Carta itself and it, it landed up, um, there's Magna Carta, we need no trouble with that, um, the Petition of Right of 1628 landed up with the Parliament saying to the King, they do therefore humbly pray your most excellent majesty that no man hereafter be compelled to make or yield any gift, loan, benevolence, tax or such like charge without common consent by Act of Parliament and that none be called to make answer or to take such oath or to give attendance or be confined or otherwise molested in any way manner uh, as is before mentioned be imprisoned or detained. So that um, we've, we see that the notion of rights in individuals and in Parliament developing and being built one on the one that had gone before. It granted um, that we then have to move on beyond that actually to the Bill of Rights of 1689. This followed the execution of Charles I, the short reign of James, his departure, and the arrival of uh, William of Orange, uh, whose arrival was conditioned by or upon the Bill of Rights of 1689. Now, in summary, and I'm not going to quote from it, but in summary, the Bill of Rights of 1689, keep focusing on the word rights. That's what we're concerned with. How do they come about? Do they exist in individuals? only in organisations, only in parliaments. The Bill of Rights granted freedom from taxation by royal prerogative. It granted freedom to petition the monarch. The citizen could approach the monarch. That becomes relevant later. It granted freedom to elect members of parliament without interference. It granted freedom of speech, at least for parliamentary purposes, and freedom from cruel and unusual punishments and from fine and forfeiture. So much for England. So far, we followed ourselves maybe from Persia, Greece, Rome, England. Let's go to America. And of course, it's impossible to understand the development of something like rights in a human being without some regard to the contemporary philosophers. And we're entering the age, as we turn to America and to the 18th century, of philosophers who were arguing and discussing what rights were. Famous among them was the English philosopher Locke, who regarded rights as something that would have existed in a state of nature before man entered into society as self-evidence rights. And those rights, he thought, were the right to life, liberty, freedom from arbitrary rule, and property. 
Now, Locke's ideas, and there are many other philosophers of the same period who held contrary views or similar views, but Locke's ideas and those of the other philosophers lived beyond Locke's death in 1704. And so that when we come to the unanimous declaration of independence in America by the 13 states, what do we find is being asserted? Hostile to England. This is not an English development. Well, we find that in the Declaration of Independence, they said this, in the course of human events, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's gods entitle them a decent respect of the opinions of mankind. They premised it then, this is part of the preamble, on the idea of the laws of nature, nature's God entitling them. But they then went on to say this, we hold these truths, famously, these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then it goes on a little bit, but... The concept of rights to things is now central to the development of what is the greatest country, not the greatest, the greatest power on earth. I express no quali qualitative view, um, uh, one way or the other. But the greatest power on earth is founded on the concept of rights by which they are prepared to withdraw from the country that had commanded them. Remember what I said at the beginning. Are rights things you can give or do you actually have to take them. Well, they took these rights, and in taking them, they took um, their country with them. Now, this particular document mustn't let us get overexcited, overcarried away um, with the idea that it's all good, um, because uh, in the second part of the document, they set out their complaints about the king and how, what a rotter he was. And uh, one of the things that uh, they said was this, he's excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavoured to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers. Read what follows. The merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages. We have to bear in mind that at the same time as these people were advancing what might, might be thought very modern rights, they were living with a philosophy, which we, not a philosophy, with a practice which we now know could have been described as genocide for what they were doing to the Native Americans. They will now be called, not by the term that's used here, is pretty well non-controversially described in those terms. So to be on the good side of claiming a right doesn't mean to say your entire philosophy is to the good. Well... Um, <coughs> We move back, I think, briefly to Persia. Why? Well, actually, we stay in America. But it's important enough to have in mind that Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, and other founding fathers read ancient histor historical works in Latin and in Greek. And indeed, as Julian Raby, the director of the Fear and Sackler Galleries, hosting that two and a half thousand year old object observed in his explanation of its significance for the American people. He said, well, in the 18th century, that model of religious tolerance are based on a state with diverse cultures, but no single dominant religion became a model for the founding fathers. Now, why do I mention this at all in getting towards Europe, but it's going to take us a bit more time yet. Because it's, it's important, if not essential, to understand that concepts of human rights are complex in their formation and international. They draw on whatever you can find that is valuable to the purpose. Do we want to have that in mind as we consider our possible withdrawal from the European Convention? Do we want to recognise that there's a big, wide history that brings us to the position which we'll come to before very long? 
Um, shall we now go to France? Because, of course, France, you may think, comes next. In 1789, at the National Assembly of France, it was declared that the representatives of the French people organized as a national assembly, believing that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole cause of public calamities and of the corruption of governments. And they determined to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural and unalienable and sacred rights of man, namely man is born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only on the general good. Uh, then dealing with political association, uh, it says that these rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. All the, of course, I've been selective in the passages from these various documents I've put before you, but I hope I haven't misrepresented them in any unfair way. Um, and you may think that what you've been reading from history is what is part of your present conception of your rights as a human being in a northern, western democracy. Back to America, briefly, we have to look at the US Bill of Rights. This was the first 10 amendments uh, of the US Constitution called the Bill of Rights. And perhaps we just ought to look at this one, Amendment 1. Congress made no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble. It's a slightly less um, comfortable one for some of us in England because, of course, by Amendment 2, there was that right of the people to bear and keep, keep, keep and bear arms which should not be infringed. So, again, you can't assume that because something good is coming out of a particular document or of a particular period of time, it's all going to be good. But, overall, by this stage, there's a big body of material coming towards us from our history to tell us what our rights might be. But does it tell us what sort of rights they are? Have they been given to us? Have we seized them? Are they inherent in being a human? Browsing old dictionaries and encyclopedias is sometimes a time-consuming, but sometimes an interesting exercise in showing us how words <coughs> have developed in their daily use. The first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, published in 1771 by the so A Society of Gentlemen in Scotland, as you may or may not know, says nothing at all about the rights of man, or indeed, as far as I can find, about rights. I may have failed in searching the index, no, not index, but searching the topics correctly. And this in the age of enlightenment, published at a time when the English philosophers Locke, Berkeley, Hume, in England, Montesquieu, Voltaire, Rousseau in France were at their height, fizzing with ideas about rights. And I was puzzled by this, and I ventured to look something up on the internet, as if I don't often do that. And I found a, a clue. I haven't been able to take it further, but it's a rather interesting clue. Because I, it said that the Encyclopedia Britannica was a specifically and intentionally conservative document brought in defense of the French encyclopédie of Denis Diderot, whose encyclopedia was thought to be heretical, not least because it included entries by Rousseau, Voltaire, uh, and Montesquieu, and of course covered those issues of the Age of Enlightenment. And why do I find that interesting? Well, because if you think of neighboring countries advancing with their philosophies, they don't actually advance together. They find things to be at odds with one another about. And that's why it remains important for us to be open to other influences. There's at least the slightest indication here that the first edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica was not that willing to be open to the arguments that were going around about rights that had formed the United States of America. You see why this might be significant in the decision we have to make? 
Now, Beaton's Dictionary, which I've never been able completely to date, but I think it's about 1860 from the entries, <clears throat> dealing with rights, says, rights necessarily implies duties. For whatever is due to one man or set of men is necessarily due from another. And it further defines rights as natural to those which a man has, natural or which a man has a natural or just claim to, such as his life, his liberty to produce labour, but there are also adventitious rights of the kind derived from appointments. For example, you become the king or you become a general. But it's, in each case, rights implying duties and natural rights. Lloyd's Encyclopedia of 1895 yep, deals with things much more summarily. Natural rights, it says, are those relating to life and liberty, and went on to say that they are that which is right or in accordance with the laws of God. Pausing there. If I were to be the person with the camera and the microphone that you saw, or you didn't see, in the little film at the beginning, and I were to ask you, okay, what's a human right? Even with this very short exposition of history, would you be any better able to do more than give some sense of what they were about? They are things that we sense. They think they, they're things we feel. But they're a bit will-o'-the-wispish, aren't they? Or are they? You'll tell me later. And in the next two lectures, because as you probably know, I'm going to hope to get some involvement by you in the next two lectures, which will enable us to tease out a bit more of what human rights may really be about. Um, the 20th century. Well, we have to move rapidly. Oh, no, I should say this. It was interesting to discover, given that the uh, Declaration of Human Rights was made in 1948, that the first of two shorter Oxford dictionaries that I looked at, which are the quite big ones, but not the biggest, had absolutely no entry of any kind in relation to... Um, Human Rights, that was one I think was in um, 1968. So uh, 20 years after the Declaration of Rights, not covered in a dictionary, not thought of as ordinary parlance. By the time you get to 2007, um, it's got about the most succinct definition of human rights that you can have. Held to be justifiably claimed by any person held to be justifiably claimed by any person. Well, it's the 20th century which we, we must focus on, and this Declaration of Human Rights that came in 1948 followed the formation of the United Nations, first of all, who then set out up a commission to deal with the issue of human rights. And it was established under Eleanor Roosevelt, the late president's wife, um, herself, uh, a formidable figure in this field. Um, the, the, declara the preamble to the United Nations Charter said, we the people of the United Nations are determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Now, when we have the Declaration of Human Rights following so quickly after the original formation of the United Nations, it's sure that they had in mind the second extract from the film, that human rights are more than just things you give. They, they're there to stop these terrible things happening again, even though, as that little extract from the film showed, it doesn't always work or rarely works. Well, when we come to the Declaration of Human Rights itself, it said, amongst other things, this disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of all people. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So an extremely important document. 
um, that focuses on rights as part of a much broader overall international policy. Um, what can we say about the Declaration of Human Rights? The first thing is it's, it wasn't a treaty. There was plans for it to be a treaty, but a treaty would, of course, be something to which people would be bound with consequences if they broke it. But um, they could also withdraw from it. The declaration, possible of all 58 members at the time, I think some abstained, is something that remains a universal declaration. It's quite hard to unmake it. And in many ways, it's perhaps better that they had a declaration that they had a than that they had a covenant or a treaty or something of that form. The commission that drafted this was international. Apart from Eleanor Roosevelt, there was a Frenchman, a Lebanese gentleman, um, a, China, a person from China, and um, Eleanor Roosevelt says in her memoirs how broad the discussion was that they ranged from Confucius to Thomas Aquinas to the theories of pluralism. And it's clear that these people, chosen no doubt for the breadth of their experience and intellect, didn't look at rights in a narrow basis. They looked at it as broadly as they could and surprisingly got this draft through uh, on the 10th of December 1948. And the... Chile member of the drafting subcommittee, a man called Santa Cruz, said this, I perceived clearly, this was on the day of the signing, that I was participating in a truly significant historic event in which a consensus had been reached as to the supreme value of the human person, a value that didn't originate in the decision of a worldly power, but rather in the fact of existing which gave rise to the inalienable right to live free from want and oppression and to fully develop one's personality. And then he goes on to say the emotions he had when it was signed. But this, you see, is approaching the business of human rights at an even more ele elevated level, really. It's saying that the inalienable right... right th sorry, th the three lines down the supreme value of the human person. It's almost as if people were starting to think of, and sometimes when I talk to students, I suspect they think of it in these terms, that your human rights actually identifies you as a human being in a way that perhaps religion might have done, but for some does not. So we won't spend too much time with the details of the Declaration because... It won't come as any particular surprise to you to know now, having seen all the other documents, uh, which may be part of the lineage of this document, that all humans are being born free, everyone is entitled to the rights and freedoms set forth, regardless of sex, language, religion, political or other opinion. Everyone has the right to life, liberty and security. No one shall be held in slavery, no torture. So that it's in line with all the documents that have gone before. Um, we don't need that. Right. Uh, article 25, I, I'm not going to trouble with Article 25, I, because I'm going to come back later to Article 22. Um, so don't bother to read it. Uh, <laughs> no, no, sorry, you have an inalienable right, <laughs> if I might say, to read whatever you like. <laughs> it, it came with you at birth, um, but don't bother. Um, <coughs> the, the Declaration of Human Rights has inspired 80 or so international human rights treaties and declarations and a great number of regional human rights conventions and has been instrumental in the constitutions of many developed and developing countries. And so it is, finally, that we come to Europe. Um, initially... After the Second World War, the idea of the development of Europe lay with an unofficial body, the European movement, that pressed for European unity. And very soon after the war, it set about drafting a human rights convention. Now, these days, a great deal is made of the fact, uh, in the party politics side of all this, that one of the prime movers of 
this um, convention, Human Rights Convention, was a man called Sir David Maxwell Fife, later Viscount Kilmuir, um, head of the chambers where I was for a time, indeed, where I was head of chambers for a time, and a very odd champion of human rights indeed. Um, famously, he did not uh, encourage the monarch to reprieve people sentenced to death. Infamously, he refused to reprieve Bentley, contrary to his um, advisor's uh, advice. And, of course, Bentley was ultimately acquitted posthumously in the 1990s. The famous case of Craig and Bentley, anybody doesn't know about it, ask people who are a bit older than you are and you'll learn. Um, <coughs> now, it seems to me, uh, but I should also say that, that um, Maxwell Fife famously cross-examined Goering when the Americans weren't doing such a good job, and he very clearly, as a result of the war, understood the needs to have some mechanism to bring people together around laws that, re that reflected the rights of humans to live in peace. And it seems to me, and you might want to have this in mind when you hear the debates on the television uh, with the Labour Party praising the man who, who allowed Bentley to hang and all that sort of thing because he's a Conservative. You, you might like to think that the more important part is not who he was, but that the origins of this, uh, this part of European community life was a government process of ours. It wasn't some strange imposition on us. We were fully engaged in it. And what this all led to was something called the Council of Europe. Nothing to do with the European Commission. Totally different. The Council of Europe still exists today. And it was the Council of Europe that established the European Court of Human Rights. And um, dealing quite swiftly with um, that, let me try and explain the position, because we'll look at this in more detail in the next two lectures. But the European Court of Human Rights is a court to which people could go, and they could go eventually directly. Remember I invited your attention to the right of being able to address the sovereign directly in your petition as a citizen, how that was part of the developing uh, pattern of human rights. Well, here, in 1966, it was possible to go directly to the Commission and to the court. And who do you think was the country that held that up? Well, I'm afraid it was us. We were quite keen on creating the Commission of Human Rights and the Convention, but we weren't very, very keen on giving it as much power as others wanted it to have. We dragged our feet a bit on that one. Um, but nevertheless, that's what happened. So you can go to the court and you can get, if you have exhausted all your English remedies, all your national remedies, you can get a decision on the court um, that can come back and affect the decision that's made in England. And what you're going to hear discussed in the months and, uh, to come before the next election is whether that's something that should be preserved for your country, our country, or, or whether it's something that should be changed. And um, there are, I think, a couple of approaches to this as a problem that I'd like to draw to your attention. Um, first of all, and I've mentioned him before in a previous lecture. Uh, no, I tell you, what, I'll stop you reading that so that I'll make you listen to me. Um, <laughs> um, uh, John Laws is a sitting member of the Court of Appeal, an extremely um, intelligent, vastly experienced, and very well-read classical scholar. And in the debate about how much power Europe should have in the business of law coming back to England, he says, don't worry too much. He says, England has always been something of a magpie. It's picked up bits and pieces from here, there, and everywhere else. He calls it the Catholicity of the English law. And he says what happens is you, you, you gather it in, and you use it, and the law changes, and you shouldn't be frightened about it. And he says, and in any event, the Parliament, uh, the European Court, can't actually force us to, compare, to change our laws. Our laws are still sovereign. The Convention, the Convention of Human Rights, which is the subject of so much discussion, the convention, yes, we have to accept as a matter of government and parliamentary decision over the years, 
But in fact, when the law comes back to us, we can embrace it, we can uh, engage with it, but we don't have to actually take it into account. And that's a very encouraging approach to take, especially if it's accurate one, as it's likely to be coming from him. Now I'll let you read. His, his writing is worth reading. On the handout, I've given you the reference. Read the lecture if you're into his lecture in full. It's, um, it's an easy and an enjoyable read, even if you're not a lawyer. But this is how he ended his lecture. And he said this. Because our law is constantly renewed by the force of fresh examples, because it reflects and moderates the temper of the people as age succeeds age, because it builds on the experience of ordinary struggles, its principles will always be buffeted by events. In their different ways, the confrontation of extremism and the absorption of law from Europe press upon the constitutional balance. But, he ends, if we keep faith with it, we shall enjoy a noble inheritance and may anticipate a tranquil future. That's one approach to the debate about human rights. There are others who take a, a different and less positive view. In the handout, I have given you another lecture, or an, I've given you extracts from another lecture, which is also given a citation. But before I come to that, I should at least tell you some of the other criticisms that have been made of the um, process of development of human rights, which has really got quite a head of steam under it since the end of the Second World War. And as long ago as um, 1998, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, you can find people cited in the paper, you can find people saying it's time to reform this document because it is a northern European-based uh, exercise, because it's concerned with supporting Western democracies, it's part of the proselytizing of Western views. And we have to bear in mind that there have been critics of the whole development of human rights at all times, and they should be listened to. Because in the same way as in the Age of Enlightenment, you didn't just pick one philosopher and say, well, that's a good idea, I'll follow him. You read all of them, if you could, in order to form your own view. Now, on the contrary side, the perhaps best read that you can have is from Roger Scruton, who is a lawyer and a philosopher. And he makes a number of extremely powerful points in the Lincoln's Inn lecture that um, I've left for you to read if you wish to. But like Laws, he's a very easy, um, a very easy read. And he is concerned about a number of possibilities with human rights. Uh, namely, he says, that what you have is that egalitarians who support the human rights movement and who dislike hierarchies of every kind have begun to insert into the general body of positive rights, right to life, liberty, and so on, a, a list of negative freedoms, as he describes them, the liberty rights specified by the various international conventions that we've looked at, some of them and some of their uh, sources, have therefore been supplemented by certain claim rights, rights which don't merely demand non-encroachment from others, but which impose a positive duty on others. And he says, this is particularly apparent in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which begins with a list of freedom rights, and then suddenly that Article 22 makes radical claims against the state, claims which can be satisfied only by positive action. And Article 22 of the 1948 uh, Declaration said, everyone as a member of society has the right to social security and is entitled to realisation through the national effort and international cooperation and in accordance with the organisation and resources of each state, and so on and so forth. And you can see immediately what Scruton's point is. 
If you say, well, not only do I have a right to read what's on the board, um, to breathe, um, to say my mind, uh, and so on, um, but I also have a right to be supported by the state, well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? It's a different category of right. It may be a jolly good thing to be entitled to be supported by the state, but is it a human right? Does it feel like one? And if uh, there's a sort of rights creep, a creeping of human rights, he, he says, well, if that's happening, this can't be the right thing. It can't really be what was ever intended by philosophers of years ago or the underlying philosophy of our age. And um, he says, there is a weight of political and social philosophy behind that Article 22, Contained within this right is an unspecified list of other rights called economic, social, and cultural, which are held to be indispensable, not for freedom, but for dignity, free development of personality. And he sets it all out. And he sets out a list, which I have given you, in case you need a crib, of some of the things that are fashionably said, or unfashionably said to be wrong, with the consequences of mission creep or um, human rights creep, to which he refers. Um, let me start then to draw things to a conclusion uh, and to invite you in due course to ask questions or make a few comments before we close for the evening. What, if anything, can we draw from what I've been able to discuss with you so far? What conclusions if any, do I feel able to make? Given that if you look to the Conservative Party now, they are unequivocally going, not unequivocally, but they are intending to withdraw from the Convention, um, to have at most the Hu Court of Human Rights an advisory body and to set up the contents of the Convention within the domestic law. If you look at UKIP, for example, they are even more blunt and shorter in what they're going to do, which, of course, involves withdrawing from the Convention, indeed would involve withdrawing from Europe altogether. I express, partly because I have, no view. But it is right, isn't it, to ask yourself the question, or is it right, to ask yourself the question, you have a freedom to choose, um, a right to choose, I beg your pardon. Is it fair to say, look, where we are now, goes back either hundreds of years, if you want to start at Magna Carta, or thousands of years. And we've drawn on sources from all around, at least part of the globe, if Confucius applies as well, even more of the globe. And sometimes we've been drawing material from our enemies. I, I, I guess the average Briton, when America was declaring human rights, would have said, well, that's a... That's a wicked thing to say. And yet now we'd all agree with it when they describe what the rights were that they asserted for themselves. And so, conclusion number one, it seems to me, is that in making our decision about where we go with human rights, we should recognise this rich, complicated history. The second thing is, I, I feel that the students and the people in that film right at the beginning are probably pretty much like we would still be right now. Because, as I said earlier on, it's something that we sense and we can feel, but we can't necessarily describe. And if at the end of it I was to ask you, is, is a human... I'm not going to do one of those sort of any questions, hands up, polls, but if I was to ask you, is it something inbuilt in the human that you have these rights, or is it something that's been given you by a state, who knows what your hands up and hands down would be. The next thing is, it seems to me, that those who have complained that these rights are over-contextualised in the Western democracies may well have a point. Imagine a, a tribe in Borneo, or possibly in Africa, untouched by um, Western society, or indeed the occupants of North Korea who've lived for a long time under an authoritarian regime, parents and children. Or indeed the Chinese students who I saw 
being interviewed by Jonathan Dimbleby on his tour to China. And these were students or postgraduate students speaking impeccable English saying, no, Mr. Dimbleby, you're, you're wrong. We don't want the rights that you say are so important. We have a different culture. Now, do we have to take note of the fact that there may be cultures who would simply say, no, thanks very much. Those are not things we want. And if they say that, or they might say that, what does that say about the true nature of a human right? Well, you could answer that uh, with a, a yes but. Yes, you might be right, but in fact, many of the developments you've pointed to, not necessarily Cyrus, because he may have given the benefits to his people, but the Americans and the French, they were taking things. They were people previously under control that was not democratic, and they chose to seize these rights for themselves. So you could say, well, it looks as though some of these rights are in any event in us as things we desire. But you can't really go much further than that, I would have thought. I would have hoped that you would think that there must be something worth thinking about in John Law's, uh, Lord Justice Law's, point that a law like ours, that we, or many people, pride for its longevity and its flexibility, has drawn on sources uh, from all around the world and should continue to do so. And that, by implication, although of course he expresses no political view or, or, or implies any, and that it would be unwise, having got a body that's providing answers to questions of human rights simply to abandon it or effectively abandon it. Even if it's not bringing in quite the results you want at the moment, might it not be better to stay with it in order to work it through because then you have the benefit of a broader input to your own knowledge. And then, as to Roger Scruton, on the other hand, is, the, is there not a pretty strong argument that he makes that once you start um, talking of rights that beyond the, the, the right to life, the right to freedom, that you, you really do run the risk of muddying yet further our understanding of what a human right is and diluting what it is. But those questions, and none of them, answer the question. Sorry, those observations, and none of them, answer the question. But in the next couple of um, events, if you'll join me, I hope that we may be able to look at what you may regard as the bad sides of human rights in the next lecture, and if you tell me what you think they are, uh, I'll select some or all of them, and I'll do what I can to research them between now and then so that I can present some analysis of the things that are concerning you. And then on the last one, to look at the good things that human rights have brought us in the period since the Second World War, human <coughs> rights law as understood, so that we can perhaps leave um, these three lectures with if not an understanding of what a human right is, um, a better understanding of the reason for our ignorance. And let me finish, as I forecast I would, with um, a, a back reference to the second little film clip. Do you remember the one that showed the terrible things that happened? Well, human rights are not just um, intellectual constructs. They are said to be things that people have and that should be fought for. And there are all these bodies, the United Nations um, and the United Nations Human Rights Council and the United Nations Human Rights Commissioner who have functions plentiful to do in relation to the state of the world. And so coming back from the academic, if it is, or the theoretical, if it is, this is what the outgoing Human Rights Commissioner, Navi Pile, um, said this very year about the present position. This is the Human Rights Commissioner leaving office. She said, short-term geopolitical considerations and national interests narrowly defined have repeatedly taken precedence over intolerable human suffering and grave breaches of 
and long-term threats to international peace and security. I firmly believe that greater responsiveness by this council, that's the Security Council, would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. An extraordinary and, I suppose, brave thing for somebody in that position to have said and focusing our minds as we look at what lies ahead on the need to get the identification of human rights right and then to recognize that doing nothing about it is wrong.